Today, we are continuing in a series of messages going through the book of Exodus. So I invite you, if you have a Bible, go ahead and power it on or turn in your Bible to the book of Exodus. We're going to pick up in chapter 7 today. We've been looking at Exodus as the story of God's rescue plan for his people. It's the origin story of the people of God, the people of Israel. Through the first few chapters, we've learned about Israel's origin. We've learned about Moses' origin, right? This leader, this great leader of God's people and how he began. We've seen him try in his own might, his own strength to lead the people of God to freedom, fail miserably, get driven out of Egypt into the wilderness where he has lived and where he encountered God. We've seen him be commissioned by God to go and this time lead the people to freedom in the power of God. Today we're going to pick up with chapter 7 and we're going to pick up looking at a section of scripture that you might be somewhat familiar with if you've been in church or been around church. You might have heard about the plagues of Egypt. That's what we're going to be talking about this week and next week. So looking in chapter 7, it starts this way. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of the land. This was the message, right? Go, let my people go. This is what Moses and Aaron were to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. So what we find in this passage is God's given them very direct, very clear marching orders, right? You're to go, you're to lead them out. And through His signs and wonders, through God's signs and wonders, the people of Israel and the people of Egypt will know that he is the one true God, that they are his people, and that letting them go is the right thing to do. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now, Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. So I find this so interesting that that at an age of life, at a stage of life when most people are throttling back, right, and retiring and looking forward to kind of taking it easy, this is the point where God commissions them and challenges them to go and do what he's asked them to do. If you're not dead, God's not done, right? You may think it's time to throttle back and, and relax. Guess what? God's not done with you yet. If you're still breathing, God has something for you to do. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff, cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Well, this is exactly the the first sign right, that God had told Moses when he encountered him in the wilderness at the burning bush. This was the first sign. This was the first miracle. Now, the word here for sign that you see again and again, signs and wonders, the word for sign in the original language in Hebrew is the word yot. And instead of plagues, because plagues only appears a handful of times in the scriptures, we're going to use the word yot because yot is the one that appears far more often in this passage and in others to illustrate and define what God is doing. A sign, a sign and wonder, is something God does for a purpose. Always, always for a purpose. Now, let's look at this one. For instance, the first yot, the first sign that we're going to look at is Moses take, or Aaron takes the staff of Moses, throws it down, and it becomes a serpent. Now, why a serpent? Why a snake? There's the fear factor, right? Because snakes are scary and you see one, you want to run away like Moses did when he first did that. I get that. Anytime you see a snake, you should run away. But is that all there is here? I don't think so. What's happening is this son of a serpent, this serpent is very, very important in Egypt. 
In fact, if you look at what the headdress that Pharaoh wears, here's a, a picture of the, the burial mask of King uh, the Pharaoh uh, Tutankhamun. You'll see at the top here, that's a serpent. That's a snake. It's a symbol of power. It's a symbol of authority. It's called a uraeus. Pharaoh would wear this on his headpiece, on his headdress, to symbolize his power and his authority. When the, the staff of God is thrown down and it becomes a serpent, it is a challenge to the authority and the power of Pharaoh and Egypt. The snake was their symbol. It was his symbol of authority. And this is a direct challenge to that. And what we're going to see here is that this contest is being set up. This contest between who is going to win, the will of God or the will of Pharaoh. Who is more powerful? Who is sovereign? Who is in charge? This Pharaoh, just like the ones before him, wore the sign of the serpent to symbolize his authority and his power. But God will take an ordinary piece of wood, a shepherd's staff, and turn it into a serpent. Pharaoh sees the snake, sees the staff turned into a snake, and he summons the wise men and the sorcerers in his court. And they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. They took staffs, threw them down, they became snakes as well by their power. Now, where did that power come from? We got some good ideas, don't we? For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Now imagine that, this one snake that's going to swallow up, eat up all the other snakes. What is that but symbolizing the authority, the power of God over the power of Pharaoh, over that of these Egyptian magicians? Who is more powerful? Who is sovereign? Whose will is going to be precedent here? Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Object lesson made. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Egyptian religious beliefs, they, they believed that Pharaoh was supposed to restore what's called ma'at. That was his job, to keep ma'at in balance. Ma'at was this balance between what is just and what is unjust, what is righteous and what is unrighteous, what is good and what is bad and evil. Pharaoh was supposed to, to hold that. He's supposed to preserve the balance of ma'at. And what we see here is that Egypt's religious beliefs are being attacked. They're being confronted for the false beliefs that they are. When Aaron's staff is thrown down and it becomes a snake and that snake eats up the snakes of Egypt's magicians, it symbolizes dominance and authority. Who is more powerful? It's obvious to anybody who's watching. But Pharaoh... Pharaoh sees this as a direct challenge on who he is, on his responsibility, his duty as the leader of Egypt to maintain and preserve the balance of Ma'at. I will not bow. I will not yield to this unknown God of the slave people, the Hebrews. I'm not going to do it. So he hardens his heart. He chooses to, in the original language, make his heart heavy. Now, in Egyptian mythology, we know that at death they believed that their heart was removed and weighed in the afterlife. And that scale that is weighed on, they're weighing their heart against a feather, and that feather is ma'at. Is your heart heavier than justice? Or is it equally balanced? Is it lighter? What you want is for your heart to be lighter, right? Right? And that means you get an entry into the afterlife and great rewards if your heart is too heavy compared to the feather of Ma'at. The Egyptians believed, well, then you get actually devoured right then. Not a pleasant ending for anybody. Pharaoh's heart is said again and again in the book of Exodus to be hardened, but that's not what the original word says. The original word says Pharaoh's heart is made heavy. Every choice, every decision he makes is making his heart heavier and heavier and heavier. And anybody reading or hearing this at the time would have known exactly what that meant. 
It's an attack on the Egyptian religious beliefs, their religious system. Because there is one true God, as opposed to all the gods that they believed in. There is one. What we're going to see here over these signs and wonders that God is going to do, we're going to see systematically God is going to address and take down all of these false beliefs. Look in verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, it's heavy. He refuses to let the people go. go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he's going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile and it shall turn into blood. The Egyptians believed that the Nile represented the Egyptian god Hopi. And Hopi was the Egyptian god that was responsible for life. This was so important. The, 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 the god who would bring life, the life of infants, right? This is an attack on the one true God. The life-giving power of the Nile without water, living in the desert is not possible. The Nile makes it possible for them to live in Egypt. This is an attack on Hopi, this false God that they believed was the life-sustaining power in the land of Egypt. Hopi is going to be shown to be impotent. And we're going to see Chaos, from their perspective, entering the land. Chaos means ma'at is absent, which means Pharaoh's not doing his job. That's what's happening here. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, take your staff, stretch out your hand over the water of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Notice here, their rivers, their canals, their ponds, not the rivers, canals, and ponds where the people of Israel are living, where the Hebrew people are living. This is going to address the Egyptians. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff, struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. I was like, hey, what? come on, magicians, come on. And so what they did is they made more blood out of water because there wasn't enough, apparently. I, I don't understand exactly why they didn't reverse it. Maybe they couldn't, but their, their option seemed to be to just repeat the miracle. They turned water into blood. We can do that too. And so they did, and that means less water and more blood, which is fantastic. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, heavy, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. And seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Pharaoh's heart is going to grow heavier each time. Heavier, heavier, because he is choosing to set himself against God. He's choosing to say no to what God is asking of him. Because if he says yes, it's going to mean that he's going to be seen as less than in the eyes of the people around him. And that will not do. Seven days, seven full days passed. Why? I think it's to give him time to think. Give him time to reflect. To say, hey, maybe, maybe I need to do something different here. I don't like these results. Maybe I need to do something different. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Remember that word serve in the original language in Hebrew is the word abad. It means serve and it means worship. Let my people go that they may worship me, that they may serve me. This message is going to be consistent to Pharaoh every time. But if you refuse, Pharaoh, to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls where you're making food. Hmm. The frog shall come up on you and on your people and on all your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. This is a direct attack on the Egyptian god Hecht. Hecht was seen as the giver of life, new life, particularly around infants. This was the patron god of midwives. Now, why is it important that the Nile, the source of life, is attacked, and then frogs, the symbol of Hecht, right? The, the, the symbol of new life, of infants, midwives. Why, why is it important that these two things are being attacked? Remember what we've seen so far in Exodus. Remember what Pharaoh told the people of Egypt to do. When you see a Hebrew baby boy, what are you to do with it? Take it, rip it out of its parents' arms, and throw it in the Nile so that it drowns. This was forced genocide. Pharaoh had tried a number of times to try to control the population of the people of Israel, right? He tried making the midwives kill the kids when they came out, when they were born. They wouldn't do that. Then he says, okay, fine. Egyptians? You see a Hebrew baby boy, throw it in the Nile. And we don't know how many kids were killed that way. What are we seeing here? The first two signs, or or signs two and three rather, the snake, the staff into a snake is the first sign. The first two that we think of normally as the plagues, right? The Nile to blood and the frogs are response. Their response to what Pharaoh had done to the people of Israel in his genocide against their children. Sin has consequences. And if we think that we can devalue life and destroy children either in the womb or once they come out immediately thereafter, and God doesn't notice, we're sadly mistaken. Sometimes people will will look at these passages and say, well, well, the people of Egypt are, are innocent here. Really, it's just Pharaoh. Why does everybody have to suffer? Are they? Because everybody participated, either actively by doing what Pharaoh said and throwing these babies in the river, or passively by doing nothing. Remember the old quote, all that it takes for evil to prosper is for good people to stand by and do nothing. That's what's going on here. Is there anyone really, truly innocent? And so the Nile turns to blood and the frogs appear and the frogs are everywhere. Hecht is supposed to be the the guardian over new life. And Hecht is shown to be a fallacy. There is no goddess Hecht. If that were the case, these frogs would not be everywhere in everything. Egyptian gods are fake. This is a judgment for what they've done to the Hebrew baby boys. What do you do? When frogs are everywhere, will you call the magicians? Can you do anything, guys? Can you do anything about this? The magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. You know what you need when you have too many frogs? You need more frogs. And so that's what the Egyptian magicians did. They provided more frogs. Yeah. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Well, that's great, right? I mean, this is exactly what they wanted. Pray to God, and I will let the people go. 
Okay, Moses said to Pharaoh, be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. Tell me when you want this to happen. When do you want me to pray? I will let you set the time, Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, tomorrow. Tomorrow? You don't want it today? Pharaoh doesn't believe this is going to happen. There's doubt throughout Pharaoh's mind here. There's no way. This is a natural occurrence. I mean, it's weird, but it's a natural occurrence. Yeah, you pray to your God and the frogs will go away tomorrow. And Moses said, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Every sign, every wonder we are going to see in this passage has a purpose. And that purpose is so that the Hebrew people, the people of Israel, the people of God, and the Egyptian people, in particular Pharaoh, will know that Yahweh is the one true God. And there is no other. Moses said, the frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards and the fields. And they gathered them together in heaps and the land stank. Think about all the frog corpses. Now, understand here that every one of these yokes, every one of these signs, right, for it to happen in the first place is a sign of God's power. For it to stop on command is also a sign of God's power. Uh, some have seen these, well, these were just natural occurrences. This had to do with, with you know, the flooding of the Nile and the red sediment, and, and this is just the wind blowing all these things in. Okay, if you take that and say that these were natural occurrences, then how did they stop on command? The power of God is seen both in the starting and in the stopping. The frogs died out and they're piled up everywhere. And think about all those frog corpses everywhere and how much that would smell. And so it did. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them. As the Lord had said, his heart is getting heavier and heavier because he is setting himself against God. I will not budge. I will not move. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff, strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. Gnats are annoying. They're a nuisance. They fly into your eyes and your mouth and your nose and your ears. They're just, they're everywhere. Imagine gnats everywhere in the land of Egypt. And so it was. This is an attack on the Egyptian god Geb. Geb was seen as the god over the dust of the earth, over the ground. But now all that dust is going to come up and become gnats. Only at the power of God, only at the word of God, do these plagues, do these signs begin and do they stop. Geb has no power. The dust will become gnats. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. For the first time, we see the magicians unable to replicate what Moses is doing. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God, meaning this is something beyond us. Like, we can't do this. We can't touch this. You need to pay attention here, Pharaoh. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened. It's made heavier and heavier. And he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water. And say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. Again, same message. Let them go so that they may serve or worship me. Or else... If you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. 
But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put a division or a distinction between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall happen. Flies everywhere. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. This is the fifth sign, the fourth traditional plague. Flies, flies everywhere. Imagine how annoying that is. But beyond that, these are biting flies. This is not a fun experience for anybody involved. There's an Egyptian god, Kofri, and Kofri has the head of a fly. And, and Kofri is responsible. He's the god of creation and rebirth. But he has no power here. Kofri's symbol, the fly, is completely under the control of the God of Israel. What do you do, Pharaoh? Flies everywhere. Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron in and said, Go, sacrifice to your God within the land. You can't leave Egypt, but go, sacrifice to your God so he'll stop all this. Right? You can go, you can worship, but you can't leave Egypt. Right? You can worship God, just, just, you know, let's control it. But Moses said, it would not be right to do so for the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. We're going to do what God said to do, how he said to do it, not your compromise, Pharaoh. We're not going to do it. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Again, he's trying to put boundaries on their obedience to God. But pray for me. Get rid of these flies. Then Moses said, Behold, I'm going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Tomorrow. I think Moses is being a little snarky here. He had asked Pharaoh last time, when do you want this to happen? When do you want me to pray? And Pharaoh was like, tomorrow. And I think Moses is being a little snarky here. I'll pray for you, Pharaoh, about these flies. Tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Don't go back on your word again, Pharaoh. You've done this. Don't do it again. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. Not one remained. Exactly what Pharaoh asked for. God delivered. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Again, Pharaoh, heaving his heart, by choosing to stand obstinately, stubbornly against God. I will not do this. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve or worship me. Same message, consistent every time. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, Behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time, saying, Tomorrow <laughs> the Lord will do this thing in the land. The next day, the Lord did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent 
And behold, not one of the livestock of, of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. God did what he said he was going to do, exactly like he said he was going to do it, when he said he was going to do it. Pharaoh sent, saw, and said, I don't care. I will not budge. I will not move. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. And it shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh and Moses threw it in the air and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. Very unpleasant. So we've moved from the first few plagues, which were more environmental nuisances, gnats, flies. Now the livestock is dead of Egypt, and now there's boils on man and beast. This is really getting more and more unpleasant. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. In another place in the scriptures, it talks about these boils as being on their knees and legs. They couldn't stand. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Moses is not going to move. He's refusing to listen no matter what happens, and no matter who suffers. So the sixth plague, the seventh sign, is the boils. But Pharaoh's not moving. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning, present yourself before Pharaoh, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve or worship me. For this time, I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now, I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose, I've raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Everybody's going to hear about this. Everybody's going to hear what God is doing. And everybody's going to know that the gods of Egypt are a sham. That there is one true God. God says, I'm going to send the full force of my power. If I were Pharaoh, I'd be a little nervous. What we've seen so far isn't the full force? Oh my. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as never has been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now, therefore, send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter, for every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. They get a warning, right? If you bring the livestock in, if you bring these animals, these beasts in, They won't die in the hailstorm. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. Some of the people of Egypt are starting to get wise to this. This God of the Hebrews, uh, well, he does what he says he's going to do. So if they're warning, I'm getting my stuff inside. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, so that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as had never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. 
The hail struck down everything that was in the field, in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I've sinned. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. (laughs) Really? That's interesting. This is the first time we've seen Pharaoh say that. This, This plague, this is an attack on the Egyptian goddess Nut, who was seen as the god of the sky, controlling the weather. Except for there is no Nut, right? There is no Egyptian goddess Nut. There is one God who is sovereign, who controls everything. And that's the point of this yot, of this sign. To illustrate that, not just for the people of Israel, but for the people of Egypt, and especially for Pharaoh, who doesn't yet get it. But here, maybe he's starting to, right? This time I've sinned, he says. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go. and You shall stay no longer. We've heard that before. Moses said to him, as soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. I know you're not going to do this. I know you're just saying it to make the plague stop. I know what you're doing, Pharaoh. The flax and the barley were struck down, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in bud. But the wheat and the emmer were not struck down, for they're late in coming up. So this had a huge agricultural impact but not complete devastation. Moses knew this, and Pharaoh knew this. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and stretched out his hands to the Lord, and the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured upon the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, made his heart heavy, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. This is the first time that we see in this passage that it's not just Pharaoh's heart that is growing heavier, it's being hardened, right? It's also his servants, it's also the people that he's leading. Notice, just before what we read, he sinned, Pharaoh sinned yet again and hardened or made heavy his heart, he and his servants. Don't miss the influence and the impact of a leader. Because that's what we see on display here. Pharaoh will not budge, he will not move. And those he leads are following his lead. The signs, these yotes that we see in this passage again and again and again, they're symbolic of chaos, right? Chaos was seen as the enemy of the Egyptians. The Egyptians hated chaos. They loved order. And Pharaoh, like I've said, was was seen as the one who would preserve order, who would preserve ma'at, and who would ward off chaos. And yet, every time Moses speaks and acts the word of God, what they see all around them is chaos. It's upsetting the order of their lives and their nation. Their economy is moving towards shambles. What's to be done? Their leader will not budge. He will not move. And they are following his lead. Pharaoh is powerless to stop them, but he will not admit it. He will not acknowledge the power of God over his own. The problem here is what neuropsychologists have termed cognitive bias. Pharaoh has a cognitive bias. He believes he is right, and that blinds him, and he cannot see anything other than what he believes to be right. He will not listen. He will not see. The problem with a cognitive bias is you really can't listen or see beyond what you believe to be right. You are so stubborn. You are so set in your ways that you will not move. And his bias is not just affecting him. 
it's affecting those around him. It's affecting those he leads. He cannot see that he is no match for God. And yet, he continually comes back. He continually comes back and stands firm against God and refuses to move. This is what happens when you start to read your own headlines. The Egyptians worshipped Pharaoh as the most powerful of all of their gods. They believed Pharaoh was the god of gods. And apparently, Pharaoh had begun to read his own headlines. He had begun to believe that as well. That no god was more powerful than him. That he could stand and prevail against any other person or any other god. And slowly, 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 it's going to be revealed to Pharaoh that he cannot stand against the one true God. Can he prevail? Can Pharaoh prevail over fake gods that don't even exist? <laughs> sure. But can he prevail against the one true God? Not a chance. Notice that God said, I could have brought you to bear. I could have made you do what I wanted, Pharaoh. But we have to understand, God is not a tyrant. God gives us free will. He gave Pharaoh free will. He gives you and I free will so that we can choose because love is only possible when we choose. And God's greatest desire is that we would love him and one another. Pharaoh refuses to move. He refuses to act justly and rightly. Even though God continually extends an offer, invites him to walk in obedience, invites him to accept what he's extending. And Pharaoh rejects it every single time. There are three questions here that the signs are pointing to. These yotes that God are doing in the midst of the people of Egypt and the people of Israel. These signs are pointing to these three questions. And the three questions are this. Who is the one true God? Is it Pharaoh and, and all the deities they believed in in Egypt? Or is it the God of Israel? Who's the one true God? Second, who is sovereign over the universe? The Egyptians had a God for everything. And they believed that those gods controlled those different parts of the universe. The Hebrews believed there was one God who controlled everything, who was in charge of everything, who was sovereign over everything. Who is sovereign over the universe? And the third question Whose will is going to come to pass? Is it going to be God's or is it going to be Pharaoh's? These are the questions that are put in front of the readers and the listeners, the people of Egypt and the people of Israel. Pharaoh has to answer these questions. Who's the one true God? Who is sovereign over the universe? And whose will is going to come to pass? To set the people free which is God's request to Pharaoh every time, to set them free is going to undermine Pharaoh's deity, right? His supposed deity. It's going to mean he has to acknowledge that he is not sovereign, that his will will not prevail. And remember, the people of Israel, God is setting them free for a purpose. We see it again and again. Free to serve and worship. Free to abode in the original language. That's the point of the signs. To illustrate God's power so that his people will be free. Because God always desires that. The interesting thing about the three questions that are placed in front of Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. The interesting thing to me is that these three questions are the same questions that you and I have to answer. And I wonder, have you ever considered these? Have you ever considered these questions? Who is the one true God? Many of us act as though we are the God of our lives. We call the shots. We make the decisions. And maybe that's where you've been. Maybe that's where you are now. I urge you, consider this question. Who is the one true God? The signs and wonders that God did were for a purpose. They're always for a purpose to point to the truth that he is the one true God. The second question, who is sovereign over the universe? Who has power and authority? And the answer that Pharaoh is going to have to be confronted with, and that you and I will eventually be confronted with, is that God is sovereign. The one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, is 
sovereign over the universe? And third, whose will is going to come to pass? Pharaoh's or God's? Yours, mine, or God's? We choose. That's the gift of free will. And my challenge to you as we wrap up this teaching today is that you see this not simply as a historical account of something that happened, which it did, but that you see this as an illustration, a sign of what God wants to do in your world. God wants to set you free, just like he wanted to set his people free from Pharaoh. He wants to set you free from the addictions, from the things that hold you back, from the beliefs that are holding you back from what he wants for you. You have a heavenly father who loves you, who wants more for you than you can possibly imagine. He wants to set you free to serve, to worship, to love. But it begins with a choice. You have to consider, you have to answer these questions. And if you do, and if you're honest, and you come to the conclusion that what Moses and Aaron are saying and pointing to is actually correct, that there is one God, it's not us, (laughs) There's one God, not a pantheon of Egyptian fake gods. There is one God, and he loves you. If you come to that point, then understand you're moving the right direction. And my challenge to you is to take your next step. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And as we wrap up this section, I want us to pray specifically that God would give us the wisdom and the insight and the discernment that we need to see him at work and the courage that Pharaoh lacked to acknowledge that we are not God, but that we need him. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, you are God and we are not. And that seems so simple and it seems so self-evident. And yet, I think often we act as though we are God of our lives. We call our own shots, we make our own decisions, and we don't consider you in that at all. Who is the one true God? Father, right now I acknowledge that it is you and you alone. And my prayer for each person who is watching or listening to this is that we would come to a place in our relationship with you where we would make that simple acknowledgement that you are the one true God, that you are sovereign over all the universe, and that we would yield our will to you. Father, I know there are people who have not made that decision. And today, you are confronting them with the truth from your word about this. And I want to invite them to pray these words. Heavenly Father, I want you to be God of my life. I yield my will to you. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead to set me free free to serve, free to worship, free to love. And because of that, because I confess this, because I choose this, your word says that I will be saved, that I'm invited into your family. I want to come home. And I know that you stand with your arms wide open. Forgive me and accept my gift of faith as I believe, choosing to believe in you. We pray together in the name of Jesus. Amen. If that's you today, we are celebrating in your decision, your choice to say yes to your heavenly Father. 
You did what Pharaoh did not. You made the right choice. I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to email us at info at southview.org so that we can follow up with you. We can encourage you and get you started on this journey with your heavenly father. That's my challenge to you. My encouragement to you is the next thing you need to do is find a community of believers. And if that's us, fantastic. We want to come alongside you. We want to encourage you, rally around you, and provide the support that every one of us needs. That's why God created us to live in community together. We'd love to have you be a part of the community that is Southview as we seek to follow our Heavenly Father and see other people who are far from God be raised to new life in Him.